Well, it starts with uh, the statement that we know little about the future. We know some things about the future. Uh, and the future is vital for business people because uh, business people invest now uh, in the light of an expected return, expected results. Uh, so how are they meant to think about uh, the future where there's no evidence at all? Uh, and the only source of information we have about it is the past, uh, which is the paradox. So how do, we loo uh, how do we read the past and how do we select out of it? Well, <clears throat> from a business perspective, the most important thing, I, don't, I think, is not to try to recount from the year zero how we got to where we are now because we would never take any action. It's selecting evidence, inevitably judgmental, uh, from the past uh, <clears throat> to analyze or put together different stories or narratives about how we have come to where we are. So the series of questions which I ask is, where are we now? How have we come here? Where are we heading? I do that always. Um, so what do people think about the past? I think this is incredibly important. Take a very simple example of Spain and the Euro crisis. Uh, the attitudes of Spain, of Spanish people, um, regardless of their political affiliations relating to the Civil War, the simplistic division of Spain into right and left, uh, <clears throat> they remember the transition out of Franco's regime as being very closely related to a certain idea of Europe, which was the old presented as the alternative to the Franco regime. You may be in supporter of the Franco regime, but you will also be probably pretty grateful that it was a smooth transition. And Europe got many of the, much of the credit for that because it supported, in various forms, along with the United States, uh, the transition into a uh, its present constitutional state. Uh, that memory of Europe being at the source of the modernization, if you want to use that word, of Spain, uh, has had very important impacts on how you interpret the 2010 crisis. Rather than challenge their own beliefs about Europe as being uh, pro-democratic, which in this crisis I would argue it has not been, two heads of government or have been thrown out, uh, Berlusconi and the um, Greek Prime Minister, the Spanish tend to talk about the crisis as economically driven not a politically driven. I believe it's a politically driven one. Uh, but their analysis is on, uh, it's a, an economic question. And why is that uh, take on it? Uh, I think it's because of the inheritance of, uh, of the idea they had about Europe as they transferred out of the Franco regime. I have just one example. Um, of course, individuals think very differently about the, pat about the pattern of the past. But my experience teaching at INSEAD is actually that nations, through their educational system, modern educational system, tend to produce similar products, which is not very surprising. If you've gone through the French educational system, you will definitely have a very different view of the past and therefore the future than you, if you went through the UK educational system, very different. Or the, the, my, my, my daughter went through the German system. No history up after 1914.
but universal history. Um, that's to do with the memory of the 1914-45 in Germany, very much so. The way I, we can think about that is, um, let's say technology is the key driver of, uh, not the only, but the key driver of uh, making interactions between human beings around this world so much more dense than it's ever been before. Uh, so that we are journeying towards a global society, if not we're already there. I don't think we're already there anywhere near, but uh, we're journeying on there, and I think it's irreversible. In that sense, globalization is an irreversible. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Friedman, who was a journalist of the New York Times, wrote a book called The Earth is Flat. And this sold very well because it sold to American precepts, uh, business precepts, that what really drove everything was technology. And behind that was the convergence story. Now, uh, there is another factor in uh, divergence, which is you enter this world, say, of globalization from extremely different standpoints, not just of economy, but of, let's say, of memory. Uh, <clears throat> a memory which holds all sorts of things, why things happened in the past, uh, how we've got to where we are, and so on. The modern technologies enable these histories actually to become realized. So take Mr. Modi and um, the emergence of the BJP in uh, India. The BJP's history is based on a Hinduva, um, the rediscovery of a Hindu land which is exclusive of Sikhs, of Muslims, of Christians, of Jews. Uh, the last two are 2,000 years old in India. Jews and Christians, very old. Older than the Sikhs, older than the Muslims. Um, <clears throat> the modernization of India is driven by um, the BJP, which represents the upper middle classes of uh, India, who have opted for a special view of India's present, which is very military, which is very radical, uh, can be extremely exclusive. Um, the same thing goes for uh, China. China is definitely absorbing all the modern technologies of the modern world and using access to world markets. But if we want to simplify, uh, the party state is doing so with a view to its own history of how it's determining to use these uh, instru institu um, instruments. Actually, we can go back to 1949 when uh, the Soviet Union exploded its first nuclear weapon, a small nuclear weapon. One interpretation of Mao Zedong, <coughs> who always thought that politics was war, 24 hours a day, seven on seven, 365 days, forever. There was no such thing as peace for Mao Zedong. Uh, without a nuclear weapon, China would be go back to the 19th century. So <clears throat> he drove, he extracted surplus, using the Marxist ter terminology, from China in order to finance nuclear weapons. And that meant millions of dead. <clears throat> 
These are very important factors. The way people use instruments uh, around the world for whatever purpose that we would like them to use people, uh, you know, instruments, modern instruments, uh, to get people wealthier. But actually things are more expensive than that. One more example. Yugoslavia. There was a study in 1989 that everybody wore jeans in Yugoslavia. And therefore the assumption was made these old national differences have faded away. That was before the collapse of the uh, of uh, the Yugoslavia and the ethnic massacres that ensued. In other words, this particular author was not looking at what was going on in the minds of people who wore jeans. Just because you wore jeans, it doesn't mean you are necessarily have nice ideas. You may have very curious ideas for us. There's no silver bullet is the answer, simple answer. Um, <clears throat> methods always have to be called in question and revisited. Uh, and new instruments applied, uh, of which, for instance, mining Facebook is one example, which is going to have a huge impact on the way that elections are pursued. We've seen that the things that uh, really determined the victory of Brexit, and many things, but one was a very crucial factor, was that uh, Dominic Cummings, who was the man at the heart of the Leave campaign, recruited three astrophysicist professors uh, to use their technologies to mine the data, which they did, and were able to target very, very accurately uh, the groups that would be susceptible to voting leave. I think that uh, Donald Trump did the same, and I think actually Marine Le Pen will be doing the same, if she's wise about it. Um, and this is going to have a very big impact. So methodology is always shifting with the technology. Um, the other point I think to make is that while one should always adapt methodology and keep uh, saying, you know, I've got to include this, there's always going to be aspects um, of the reality which you leave out, which could be the crucial ones. Um, I've forgotten in the name of the Turkish Prime Minister in 2002, um, anyway, a uh, famous man who'd been around since the early 70s, a social democrat, and uh, he'd really lost control of inflation. Uh, he had a very rough cabinet meeting. All the journalists were work working outside. He walked out very angrily and uh, the journalists realised that something was wrong. So they rushed to their telephones. This was just before mobile phones or roughly at the edge of it. And within a few seconds, the Turkish lira had fallen 20, 30 percent. Now, nobody could possibly, you could, have possi you could have foretold that the lira was a weak currency and that sometime it was likely to fall, but you could never actually tie, you could never actually guess, unless it was entirely by chance, when the prime minister would walk out in an angry from a meeting and make it quite clear to the uh, assembled journalists that there was no agreement on public policy. Uh, you can never get it right. You can never estimate the future. And I think that is la condition humaine. If we knew the future, we wouldn't be humans. We just would be different animals. And it is an arrogance uh, to think that we did know the future. One of the great arrogances of economists in the period of 80s through to 2008 was that they weren't even, were not looking at the particular data, 
the huge German and Chinese surpluses and the way that was being recycled, they weren't looking at that. They were looking at other indicators, which their models had said were the key ones. So they were not looking at it at all, but they thought they'd really mastered the future, which led Mr. Gordon Brown to saying, um, we are beyond boom and bust now. I know how to control it. Arrogance is always an indicator of future problems, 